Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Sarah Rosen Wartell, and I have the extraordinary privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute. And I welcome you all here, and let me also welcome our online audience. I want to encourage those of you who are online and also in the room that if you want to share your thoughts and observations during this event to use the hashtag live at urban and for those of you who are online we want you to be part of the conversation as it's going so we really welcome you to send comments or questions that we'll use later in the program to events at urban.org and so we can all be together um, some decades ago our society said to our able-bodied low-income folks get skills, get work for a better future. But if you imagine that you're a low-income single mother, for example, and you had the opportunity to get into a training program, you got to make sure while you're building those skills that there's a way to feed your children, to pay for childcare, to provide them with health care. You're probably, in many cases, eligible for support for those things. Work supports is the phrase we'll use here today. Um, but the process of applying for and sustaining your eligibility through different programmatic rules can sometimes itself be a full-time job and require a great deal of organization of your paperwork, time, transportation, etc. And lose one of those work supports and your ability to focus on getting skills or sustaining low-wage work is diminished. The research that we'll hear about today has shown that when parents receive the full package of work supports they qualify for, it can stabilize their work life and promote the health and well-being of their children. But many eligible families don't receive the help partly because of barriers in cumbersome, confusing benefit systems, inefficient, outdated processes, and archaic business mechanisms. These th systems burden the families who are seeking the support that we as a society have collectively decided to provide to them, so they're not gaining access, to, we're not even effectuating our own decision making. And they're also costly to the state and local service agencies that have to provide these services as well. Those insights are the origin of the Work Support Strategies Program, a unique program of investment by philanthropy to accelerate change in the delivery of public services. And this program that we're going to talk about today really was the brainchild of the Ford Foundation's Helen Newborn. It was developed and led by Olivia Golden, first when she was an institute fellow here at the Urban Institute, and more recently uh, as she's led the Center on Law and Social Policy CLASP. But it was a three-way partnership operated from the beginning with CLASP, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and I think Stacy Dean is here somewhere. Hi, Stacy, uh, who has been our great partner. Uh, and the Urban Institute has been both the fiscal home and the evaluation partner of the project. The Work Support Strategies Evaluation Team here at Urban was led by Pam Loprest and Heather Hahn. Heather will be on our panel in a few minutes. And they've developed a five-year study of examining, examining six different states' efforts to improve access to and delivery of those benefits. The Work Support Strategies Initiative provided those states with expert technical assistance, peer support, and financial backing to try to make it easier for people to gain access to the services that they were entitled to and in hope that that would then yield benefits to their capacity to enter the workforce, sustain, and, and the welfare of their families. So today what we're going to find out it is more about what those evaluations have demonstrated, what lessons can be learned from the operation of the program, and find what those challenges mean for those people who continue around the country to try to bring services to those who most need them. Um, this project has really been a very special partnership, as I said, between CLASP and the Center on Budget and Urban. And I just want to spend a moment to say uh, something we're going to hear in a moment, and our, uh, Heather will introduce all of our panelists, but I just wanted to say something about our two colleagues. Um, Olivia Golden, uh, uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing both when she was at Urban and I now serve on the board of the CLASP. Um, is a really an extraordinary and dynamic leader. Um, one of the things at Urban, as you know, we're about bringing uh, insights from research to bear to improve policy. And Olivia has this extraordinary experience of being a true evidence-based policymaker at every level of government, city, state, and federal in trying to make the pro programs work better for uh, all our low-income families in this country. It's been a career-long passion that she's now 
executing beautifully at CLASP, and we're very proud of her uh, work there. Um, uh, Bob Greenstein needs no introduction to anyone, probably in this room, um, but uh, is been the most um, uh, passionate, committed advocate of making our Washington and state and local government policy-making system work better for low-income people. He's a, not only a brilliant strategist, but he has been effective and, and is uh, trusted on both sides of the aisle and by the media and others precisely because he starts from analysis and evidence and proves the case why we can make life better, and that is the spirit of today's event, and I'm really appreciative to both Olivia and Bob for being with us today. Finally, I just want to say a word about the people who made this five-year effort possible. Uh, the Ford Foundation provided generous lead funding for the initiative and its evaluation. Additional funding was provided by OSF, Annie E. Casey Foundation, Kresge, and J.P. Morgan Chase. And I think we may have Mike Laracy with us here today. I'm not seeing Mike, but I thought he would be. Yeah, there he is. Hi, Mike. Uh, a great partner in this effort as well. Um, as I said, we're going to start this um, uh, with just a few more moments of observation before we get to the panel. The Work Support Strategies Initiative was born of Helen's insight over many years of grant making and efforts to improve outcomes for low and moderate income families. So at this culminating event of the Work Support Strategies effort, we've asked Helen once again to start us off, to describe for us what those insights were that caused her to help uh, bring this team together to find a strategy to work this through. Um, and her own observations of what the uh, work that she initiated has uh, led to. So I hope everyone will join me in welcoming and thanking Helen Newborn. So first, I do want to thank Sarah and the Urban Institute for inviting me to share um, some of the thinking and early activities that went into our planning for the Work Support Strategies Project. And she uh, ably described some of it, give you a little more detail. So really to start at the beginning, after the TANF uh, regulations were put in place post-welfare reform, the Ford Foundation began to focus its attention on the single mothers uh, and children and wonder how they would manage now that so many more of them would be at work. Well, even if they got jobs, we knew that these jobs would be poorly paid with either few or no benefits. And so it would be critical for these families to continue to receive the food stamps, the child care, and the health care that could uh, stabilize them and, and would be capable of filling the gaps in their low salaries. So I started by uh, funding research and policy analysis just to understand the depth of the problem that we were facing and uh, soon learned that this went way beyond welfare leavers, that at that time in the United States, we're talking barely 2,000, um, more than 15 million U.S. workers earned very low wages and lived in very li low income households. Uh, and publicly funded work supports had the potential to stabilize these employees and their families but many were either unaware, as Sarah said, or they didn't even know they qualified, or they would face considerable uh, barriers in accessing them. That's a polite way of putting it. Um, data told us that barely 10% of workers received all the benefits that they were entitled to, and most received just one. So we began to test, that's at Ford, additional delivery systems, and one of the first activities I funded was a project with workforce one stops that were trying to help job applicants coordinate access to benefits with the TANF agencies. Um, I later made grants to community-based organizations that were prepared to work with willing employers who wanted to help their low-wage workers access benefits. However, whether we were working to integrate the TANF WIA system or working with CBOs helping willing employers, the success rates were very slow, and the process still took months. And the positive results, when they happened, often happened when the CBOs learned to do what I began to call workarounds. They figured out how to get around the bureaucratic system um, that was, and the inefficient system that was actually delivering benefits at the state level. 
So as all of this became clearer to me, I was convinced that real progress wouldn't happen until we figured out a way to work directly with the states and help them modernize and improve their delivery systems. So to begin to flesh out my interest working directly with states, I raised this with two of my grantees that were stellar and had very different strengths. The first was the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, who at that point had a small foundation grant where they were working with states that wanted to modernize and simplify their benefits. Um, they had also just recently, at that time, led the very successful effort to modernize food stamps so that 10 million additional families were then able to qualify so that they really had a lot of that expertise. And the second was the Urban Institute, an organization that, as you know, had a much larger infrastructure and a track record of working with state systems on a large scale. So I asked two of the staff at these grantees, um, Olivia Golden, who was then at Urban Institute, and Stacy Dean, who was at the Center on Budget, and I asked them to work together and send me a request for a planning grant so that we could get the process started. And CLASP joined that core group very quickly after that, but the first two were the ones who started the process. So we all believed that only states themselves could really have a significant impact on the problem of low uptake, and that what the project would have to figure out is how to identify and work with some states who wanted to do that. And we had to do that, now we're talking mid-2000s, in the face of a deepening recession, more people needing and wanting benefits, and state budget cuts that were reducing staff and increasing caseloads all across the country. So following the year-long planning grant, we created an advisory committee of experts. We developed an RFP, and we went out and invited states to apply. And surprisingly, 27 states sent in applications. Quite honestly, we were stunned. And one of the reasons we were stunned is that we felt that government benefits were not very popular. And we, were, we couldn't imagine that even more conservative states would want to figure out a way to improve access to these benefits. Um, but nonetheless, and after then 13 site visits to visit some of the states, we identified six, and they were red and blue states. So they were Idaho, Colorado, Illinois, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Rhode Island. Um, and that allowed us to test a range of changes in, um, and reforms in states that were of different sizes, had different political views, and different agency configurations. So, and the goals for project were fairly straightforward to ensure that workers had uh, an opportunity to gain access to and to retain all of the government benefits that they were entitled to. A second goal was to uh, simplify and modernize the state's human services agencies so that agency staff could more easily manage their very large caseloads. And the third goal, part of which I think we're doing today, is to reach out to audiences in other states and at the federal level with examples of changes that could be easily replicated. And just a, an aside to say that having goals that improved not only families but helped the overwhelmed state agencies at the same time, I think helped ensure that this project would have much broader appeal. So I think there, we were really, I think, quite smart as a team in figuring out how to do this and reach a very wide audience. And I think the reality is, as it turned out, that neither red tape nor bad customer service is popular with anyone, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. <laughs> so it's also important to say that I think the states understood that they were not functioning well. But despite their huge, sometimes billion dollar programmatic budgets, they lacked the specific expertise and very often even the small amount of funding that would be needed for research and development that could have helped them figure out how to step back, do a thorough analysis of their problems, redesign their business process, retrain their local staff, and understand how technology could improve all of this. So the three grantees, now at Center on Budget, Urban, and CLASP, provided overall management and support to the project. They ensured that the states received the technical assistance from national experts, that they could use the generous federal funding that was then available to improve technology, and they got, and helped them get peer support from their colleagues so that the six states learned a lot from each other. 
And so the states took on their outdated computer systems, the bureaucratic duplication of effort, the overburdened local offices, and the unnecessarily complex policies to move their work supports programs into the 21st century. And as you heard, five foundations, Ford, Annie Casey, Kresge, Open Society, and J.P. Morgan Chase all supported this effort. Uh, but indeed, Ford's contribution of about $21 million over the five years was the biggest chunk. Not surprisingly, there were setbacks and delays. But after a few years of support, the project has shown us that improving dysfunctional local office processes can deliver significant results. Just some quick examples, and I know you're going to hear more. Some states now auto-enroll children and families into Medicaid by using the information that they already have in the SNAP case file. So this means virtually no extra work on behalf of the family to really uh, double the benefits for them. Um, more families receive benefits the same day rather than historically when it took weeks or sometimes even months to get benefits. Application forms have been simplified. One state reduced their form from 32 pages down to eight. Uh, you can now sign up for benefits online. And all six states use the very generous federal funding that, uh, again, the federal government made available through the ACA to, um, and the sophisticated TA they got from the grantees to really modernize their technology and integrate their computer systems. And this was a huge, huge change. So to ensure that we all benefited from this, the, the, we funded the Urban Institute to conduct a thorough evaluation of both the process and the outcome. And I'm sure you're going to be hearing more about the results from them today. So without a doubt, certainly from my perspective, the project showed that relatively modest amounts of foundation funding can help mammoth state bureaucracies take giant steps toward modernizing their human service systems. I think this was a win-win-win for everybody. Many more families are receiving critically needed benefits. The, envir the work environment for thousands of state agency workers is noticeably improved. And philanthropy really can be proud that partnering with government has allowed us to create a project with scale, with impact, and with sustainability. So thank you all for being here. I'm delighted now to introduce Olivia Golden, who is the executive director at CLASP, and she'll kind of take the next steps. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much to both <coughs> Helen and Sarah, and to Helen for her wisdom in, in initiating and supporting work support strategies. You've heard, I'm Olivia Golden, Executive Director at CLASP and Director of Work Support Strategies, and my job is to kick off a lively, energetic panel discussion on making government programs work for families, lessons, and next steps. Um, I just want to let both the people in the room and the people watching on the web know of the amazing audience we have. For those of you on the web, we have a packed group in the room. I've looked at the backgrounds. We have people from the federal government, from the Hill, from state and local governments, from labor, from policy, stakeholder advocacy groups, research, and philanthropy. And we have several hundred more watching and listening on our simulcast um, as well. So when I think about what would make everybody come besides the lunch, which I'm sure is one of the attractions, um, it always is at Urban. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking is that you may be motivated by what made me so eager to come, which is hot off the press's results about what, in fact, all these years later we can say about what the states accomplished and what they didn't or what they found harder. Um, and so the first goal of our panel discussion is to have a lively discussion of the new research reports being released today from the Urban Institute, what they tell us and what they mean. The second goal is to take that and talk about next steps, particularly in other states that haven't yet taken up the WSS ideas and at the national level. What can we learn? We have amazing panelists from research, from state, from national perspectives, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, but I'm just going to say one or two more things. You've heard a lot about work support strategies. You've heard all the thank yous I was going to give to the funders, to the three national um, partners, um, and to the six states, Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, Rhode Island, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, but I just want to highlight one thing about this initiative as you think about this conversation. We started planning for this. Helen gave her planning grant to Stacey Dean and to me 
I think in 2009, seven years ago now, before we had any, well, before we knew, certainly, that there would be an Affordable Care Act, before we had any idea the details of what it would look like in the depths of the recession when states were facing an intense increase in need and lack of staff. Um, several elections ago, many states have gone through several administrations since then. So to me, this is like a long-running, multi-part novel, which now we're finally, I don't think it's writing the last chapter, but perhaps writing the last chapter of volume one, and that's what we get to do today. So to help us talk about what happened and what we've learned, we have a terrific group of panelists. We're going to begin with Heather Hahn, who's the senior, um, senior researcher here at the Urban Institute and co-director of the WSS evaluation, long history in many different settings of working on research about low-income families and programs that serve them. And she's going to give a crisp summary of the results from the most recent papers. Then Christian Sura, who's the director of the Health and Human Services Department in the state of South Carolina. Um, before that was the deputy chief of staff for budget um, and management with um, Governor Nikki Haley in South Carolina. Before that, cabinet secretary for administration in Pennsylvania and with a history of working for leaders in Pennsylvania over almost a dozen years um, of working for leaders of both parties, um, including Governor Rendell um, at the end of his time there. So he's been in cab he's well positioned to talk to us about the perspective from many different states. Then Seamary James, who will give us a, both a state and a national perspective. She's now Vice President for Policy at the National Black Child Development Institute. It was our loss at class, but NBCDI's enormous gain when she took up that opportunity. Before that, she was Deputy Director for Work Support Strategies at CLASP, so she has a view of all the states. But before that, she was in the state of Illinois um, doing their pioneering work in local offices to change, change process. And finally, closing with a national perspective, Bob Greenstein, you've heard Sarah say um, his enormous distinction as the leader of, and founder, founder and president of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And Bob is really able to give us two perspectives, um, one as a national partner from the beginning in WSS, but I think even more, we're looking for his extraordinary ability to pinpoint what's important and how it makes a difference in the national perspective. So before I turn it over to Heather, just one note on format. Um, we're going to start with very crisp presentations from everybody. These are all people who could hold a room spellbound for an hour, but they've all promised <laughs> not to do that. Um, they're all going to be very brief. Um, then I'll ask a few questions to get the conversation going, and then we're going to take questions from the room and the web, probably for the last half hour or so. And just to let everybody know who's watching the, the, the video cast, watching the video on the web, you can send your questions to events at urban.org, um, and you can send them anytime, and we'll be taking them during the last part of the program. So with that, let me turn it over to Heather. Okay, thank you. And I do want to also acknowledge the WSS evaluation team. It's a large team of researchers, many of whom are here in the room, and many who have moved on over the years to graduate school and, and other um, positions. But it was a large team effort. The evaluation included site visits to each of the states each year, uh, where we, over the, the time, had hundreds of individual and group interviews. Um, we reviewed hundreds of quarterly reports and planning documents and other written materials. We reviewed state administrative data that the state sent us so we could track outcomes over time. We conducted client experience surveys and focus groups with clients. So it's all of that research that um, is behind the results that I'm going to share today. So part of what the evaluation team was doing is just documenting what did states do um, during this time. And what the states did was with leaders, the top leaders in the state agencies and leaders um, at all levels of the state government, they put together teams that really focused on finding solutions to the problems um, that Helen and others have outlined this morning, this afternoon. Um, they made changes in their state policies. They changed their technology. They changed their processes for accepting and processing applications. Um, and this was a huge undertaking. 
uh, states had very ambitious goals for uh, making improvements in the delivery of work supports at the same time that they were implementing the Affordable Care Act. So uh, it was a, a big hurdle. Um, but still, by the end of the WSS period, states were able to provide faster service and improve access to SNAP and Medicaid um, and make other changes. Those are the two I'm going to focus on. First, I want to um, talk about the faster service. So states are required to make a determination if somebody's eligible for SNAP, which is um, formerly known as food stamps, um, within 30 days. But that means a family is, a hungry family is waiting for 30 days to find out if they're going to get the benefits. Um, and so for many states, they, their changes in policy and technology and business processes were able to shorten that time, um, in some cases to the same day that someone applies. So in Colorado, Illinois, and Rhode Island, they are now processing SNAP applications on the same day that someone applies for a quarter to a third of the SNAP applicants. This is double or triple the rate that it was at the beginning of the WSS period. Idaho was already doing this for the majority of their SNAP applicants, but they still managed to eke out an even higher rate by the end of the period. And even if they weren't processing them on the same day that they applied, which was the ideal, states were still able to reduce the average number of days that it takes to process an application and to help families get those benefits faster. The other uh, finding that I wanted to highlight was that more eligible families are able to access a package of work supports. And we particularly were looking um, at medical assistance and, and food assistance. So when families apply for assistance, they're usually applying because they have an urgent need either for food or for medical assistance. But over time, they often need both of those kinds of assistance and may be eligible for both. So one measure of how well a state is meeting a family's needs is whether those who are eligible for both of those kinds of assistance are actually receiving it. And during the WSS period, Colorado, Illinois, and South Carolina made significant improvements in this area. Idaho already was um, nearly all of the families who were eligible for both of those benefits were receiving them, and yet Idaho still eked it out a little higher at the end of the period. So I highlight these two really dramatic results. Not all of the results were that dramatic. These changes are not easy. Uh, and sometimes the successes that states experienced came after um, some initial mistakes that they made. Uh, and they all did demonstrate progress. But some had more progress than others. Or even within a state, sometimes um, states made great strides towards some goals while falling short on, on other goals. Uh, and this is an ongoing process. These changes that have been uh, started and are things that are continuing. And so there may, I expect that there will be further results down the road. But I just want to highlight that this, what we found with the WSS evaluation is that <coughs> large scale change is possible um, in these critical work support programs. Thank you very much. Christian. Sure. Well, thank you. The, I should probably begin by giving a brief background on sort of what South Carolina government looks like. It's, a, it's very fragmented. Uh, almost every program has its own agency to go with it. And so, so I, I lead the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the Medicaid agency. Uh, we're responsible for independent living programs and a few others as well. And, and the main partnership that was at the center of our project in South Carolina was between HHS and the Department of Social Services, which is responsible for, for, for SNAP, for the food stamp program, uh, for TANF, the, the old welfare program, and for, and for child welfare services at the same time. And so uh, we, we share offices in many counties. South Carolina has 46 counties. Uh, we often are co-located inside the same building, but historically have had separate queues. People, even though they might be there to seek both forms of benefit, We'll have to go through one line and then back up and then get in the next line, even inside the same lobby uh, on a pretty routine basis. And so not a very customer uh, friendly kind of an experience. Um, Health and Human Services was actually born of a, of a messy divorce a couple decades ago. Uh, and so we were the uh, cast off uh, stepchild of the Department of Social Services. Um, and, and so for many of the more senior staff, um, there's still a lot of personal baggage associated with that breakup uh, and who was sent to which agency. And so that's one of the things we had to work with 
uh, in, in a handful of specific offices along the way. Um, you know, in terms of why we were interested, I, mean, I know there's been a fair amount of interest in sort of the you know, sort of red state versus blue state dynamic. Um, you, you know, for us, one of the main goals was to improve the experience for our applicants and beneficiaries. So, you know, I gave an example a moment ago of having to stand in, in, in two queues. Um, if you're looking for employment assistance or, or other programs as well, you could easily be standing in four or five queues, uh, depending on how many of these programs you, you think you may be eligible for or may be uh, seeking assistance for. And so that was one of our uh, priorities for our project. Um, you know, as, as Olivia mentioned a few minutes ago, I spent a, a decade in government in Pennsylvania before spending the last five and a half years or so in government in South Carolina and have uh, been a member of the cabinet for both Democratic and Republican administrations. And I can say that um, you know, one of the common themes of each of these governors is that they want to beat administrative cost out of the system uh, regardless of uh, where they fall in the political spectrum. Now, they might have a different use for that money uh, depending on where they are on the political spectrum, but, but the mandate uh, that they give their cabinet as administrators and managers uh, is the same in terms of, of that kind of focus. And so you know, that and, and a better customer service experience are, are things you, you commonly see. And so for us, it was trying to get to, to one queue. It was trying to get to a more seamless experience. It was trying to improve um, you know, first touch resolution, to you know, try to be able to give people a final answer on whether they're eligible or not right out of the gate without having to wait longer or have to do follow-up encounters. Uh, one, just because there's a quality of life aspect to that, obviously. Two, because if we do have to follow up with you by phone call or by email, it just increases the likelihood that there's going to be some kind of a miss. Whether we have the wrong phone number, you might change addresses. You know, many of those who uh, are on some form of public assistance have some kind of um, you know, instability in terms of what their living arrangements might look like. And so you know, the, the longer it takes to get an answer, the more likely it is that there's going to be some kind of a drop fall along the way for those kinds of reasons. Um, you know, we've started to share information between the Department of Social Services and Health and Human Services. We're using it for you know, a variety of purposes. Much of it is tied to the, the eligibility process, whether that be upfront in terms of rendering an initial decision or uh, for programs that have some kind of an annual recertification and, uh, requirement. We can also use information uh, along those lines as well. And so you know, at the beginning of the project, we were not having, uh, we didn't have those kinds of data sharing agreements in place. Uh, and everything was a manual exercise each year for Medicaid to decide if people were still eligible or not. Um, an outright majority of the cases that now come up each month for annual recertification, we're able to use these data matching agreements to confirm that people are still eligible for Medicaid and to continue their benefits without having to go through that process. And so, you know, th those are the kinds of um, you know, material impacts we've had over the course of the last couple of years, thanks in, in, in large part to, to this work. Thank you very much. Marie. Hi, um, so as Olivia mentioned, um, I enjoyed two years working on the Illinois team for work support strategies, um, a team that was brought in to implement strategies to increase access to work supports. Um, our motivation, uh, like South Carolina, um, was a commitment to customer service. Um, but what our focus was, was um, in Illinois, we had, we had a lot of integration. We had a common caseworker between programs. Um, our eligibility system uh, was shared across programs. Um, but what we needed to really attack in Illinois was the back end process um, and take care of those, um, address major delays. Um, as Helen mentioned, the weeks and months that families were waiting um, after they applied for benefits was an issue for us and we wanted to address customer service in that way, taking it down to same day service um, as the results of evaluation verified. Um, so um, in Illinois where we were focused on business process improvement, we also found that there was a lot of opportunities in policy. Um, and that is a learning I think across the states um, that many states found that they had more authority to implement policy change at the state level than they initially thought. These are federal programs but a lot of the policies are set at the state level and may have been set 10 and 15 years ago and the state is still constrained by policies that, that they set um, at the state level. Um, so uh, taking up that, um, taking on policy and looking at how policy can be improved um, to increase access, all six states implemented changes so that families could apply for SNAP and Medicaid simultaneously. 
um, states met the requirements for the Affordable Care Act um, and maintain that um, commitment to integration. So, for example, um, in both Illinois and South Carolina, um, they're using SNAP data to um, SNAP eligibility information for Medicaid enrollment. As was mentioned, Colorado's peak online application um, is an integrated application where families can apply for uh, SNAP, Medicaid, TANF, and child care assistance in one application. Um, and states also took advantage of um, um, addressing policy um, within a system. So, for example, in Idaho, for their child care assistance program, uh, they redesigned their co-payment structure for child care assistance programs. So as families receive assistance for child care, they also pay into, um, they have a co-payment that they're responsible for, and Idaho simplified that system to ensure that families weren't overburdened um, by the child care assistance program. Um, and then my final point is um, about what states learn across states about data. Um, that uh, using data as your focus for problem solving and decision making, um, which sounds very easy to say, but I think what states learned was, and I'll quote um, Olivia here, there are three data capacities. So there's getting data, there's getting access to data, sharing data across agencies um, was one barrier that multiple states addressed. But not only getting it, it's understanding it and using data. That, um, that can be a huge barrier um, and is a, is a cultural barrier. Um, I think it's, it's Pam Lopress that talks about it as having a culture of data and pulling in, um, pushing for a, a culture of data where, um, it's my, my uh, final point, is just that you need that data-friendly culture so that everyone at each level in the organization has the training they need to understand how to use data. So from the caseworker to the manager to the office manager, they understand the role of data and the way that they um, implement programs and the way that they serve customers. Thank you very much. Bob? Well, I think I'd like to make four observations. Uh, the first picks up on something somewhere I just said, which is that as it turns out, there's more opportunity, there's more ability to align programs, to align application and renewal processes and verification processes across programs than people had originally realized. This is one of the findings in one of the evaluation reports by Julie Isaacs, Michael Katz, and David Kasabian that Urban has put out. Um, and I think this is true not only for state officials who as your report says, often thought there were greater obstacles than there were, but very much for federal officials as well, who often thought that various kinds of steps to better align federal programs were not possible because of differences in the rules. Um, at both state and federal levels, officials tended to know their own program in depth and not all the technical details of the other program, and so differences in things like definition of income, who's in the household unit, initially looked insurmountable. Whereas if you could go into technical detail on the guidance and the sub-regulatory guidance and the administrative waiver opportunities and the like, uh, often one could do more uh, than was commonly understood. Uh, I remember after enactment of the Affordable Care Act, um, when Stacey Dean and her team and our health policy people went to USDA and HHS and said you have a great opportunity to let states do electronic screens of their SNAP caseloads to automatically enroll people newly eligible under the Medicaid expansion and Medicaid, the initial reaction of the two federal agencies was nice thought but we can't do it. Too many differences between the programs and things like income and household unit definition. And we needed to do what a, about a 40-page technical document showing you could actually do it. And eventually, the two federal agencies kind of thought, wow, we can actually allow this. So I think one of the places this leads, one of the lessons, is that at both state and federal levels, we need, they can be small, but we need little teams 
that are in effect cross-program and that look for opportunities within the IT or other systems of their states to put things together in this fashion. I think, Stacy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Stacy has told me that North Carolina and Colorado uh, now both have such units in their states. I think we very much need such a unit at the federal level as well, particularly crossing Medicaid, SNAP, and so forth. Um, and that we probably need, it ought to be set up in such a way at the federal level that it comes with some internal bureaucratic incentives to actually make progress on this front uh, for which there haven't really been uh, incentives in the past. Uh, thought number two, a kind of an obvious point. Here we are at a unusually polarized political time and yet this demonstration was successful across states regardless of their political coloration. It isn't an inherent characteristic of either red but not blue or blue but not red states that they would like to streamline, achieve economies and administrative costs and staff requirements and better serve clients at the same time. Needless to say, a number of the advances that were done as part of this demonstration wouldn't have been possible 10, 15 years ago before big advances in information technology that facilitate more pro cross-program data sharing. We continue to be in an IT revolution. I can't even imagine what the advances will be 10 years from now relative to today. But it's likely that as there are further IT advances that will create still more opportunities to efficiently align programs. So I think we need to, both states and the feds, to be set up in a way that they can be on top of the IT advances as they occur with an eye to thinking about how does this facilitate further uh, cross-program coordination. Third observation is just that uh, the emergence in recent years of very important academic research finding the adverse impacts that toxic stress can have on children's brain developments and life chances and the gains in educational attainment and in some cases all the way into employment and earnings in adulthood that children get when they have access to core benefits rather than when they don't. Uh, I think this underscores in ways we didn't know when WSS started just how important it is to make sure that poor families and particularly low-income children do get all of the benefits for which they're eligible across the key programs. It just underscores the importance of this enterprise. And finally, another fairly obvious observation, I guess, uh, it shows that progress can be made in better aligning programs and better serving low-income families and providing states flexibility to make those gains without having to shift costs to states and clients through mechanisms like capped block grants that don't respond to increases in need in the economy, that these advances can be made without undoing core basic national standards like the guarantee level for benefits under the Thrifty Food Plan or the federal rule that all young kids up to a one and a third times the poverty line are eligible for Medicaid or that poor kids get EPSDT. Uh, so I think that's a particular note that we're not in an even or, or choice where either or choice where you can make progress on coordination but you erode core standards which could then lead to problems on the toxic stress front or you stick with that, but you can't make progress on coordination. This is, in a sense, a third way, much more promising, in my view, than either of the two uh, original starting points. Thank you very much. So I want to ask the whole panel a question, because I'm guessing that for some people in the audience right now, it feels as though maybe this is too rosy a picture. How could something so terrific happen so easily when it has, didn't happen for decades before it? So let me ask everybody um, to say something about the challenges, about a moment, perhaps a moment when you thought it was going to blow up, or perhaps something hard that you got through, 
what are some what are some challenges that come to mind? Who wants to start? I can Seem right. Go ahead. <laughs> start. Um, so um, as mentioned, I was uh, part of the Illinois team, and um, so I can't remember who said it, but um, it was mentioned that trial and error and the role of trial and error. And I think that trial and error is inherent to this type of work when you're doing large scale systems change because there's so many elements that are, that are core to it. So you have technology changes, um, using data, the use of data. So you need your technology to give you that data. You need your, your managers, your caseworkers to understand and be able to employ data in their daily decision making as you're changing technology to respond to customers' need, you need your caseworkers and managers to understand that technology. So there's a role of training, um, and missing any one of those parts gets you back to your trial and error. And so trial and error is inherent to it, and it, it's a continual process where you're updating training, you're updating your technology, you are um, hearing from families, the families that you're serving, how those, how those um, changes to technology might even have an adverse effect. And so there's a, a feedback loop there that's extremely important, that communication is one of those pillars that you need as you're making changes. So I would say the, the biggest challenge was keeping the commitment to trial and error and never feeling like, oh, we've done it. Keeping that commitment to communicating at the caseworker level, to communicating to the families that we serve, and continuing to go back and make improvements. Christian? Yeah, I think for us, you know, the first one is probably just turnover, right? So, so you know, the, each of the participating agencies have had leadership changes along the way, and so it's making sure that the project, you know, keeps the same level of attention and priority through those kinds of transitions. You know, I think also we probably could have done more to, to both, you know, broaden and go deeper in, into the organizations in terms of um, highlighting the project and making sure that a broader range of people were involved and directly engaged in it. Um, that kind of, you know, that kind of early on capture of more participants is important if the goal is to really institutionalize this over time, you know, and not have it be a, you know, a brief, this is a couple year project and then we all move on and forget about it. You know, if you want to have, you know, sweeping and sustainable change, you need to get more people inside the organization brought into it. Uh, and I think the last one is really, just, it's, it's, it's like so many things in government. I mean, there's just an inverse relationship between importance and urgency. Um, you know, and, and there's so many things that get on our calendar and take up our time and distract us from the long-term, you know, meaningful goals that we spend so much of our time dealing with today's crises uh, and what needs to be managed in that, um, you know, in that next couple minutes, next couple hours. And it's hard to keep people focused on the long-term uh, when they spend so much time putting out fires. Well, and one thing that makes me think about stepping into my WSS role is that in some cases, I'm thinking about Illinois and North Carolina, perhaps others, leaders who were good at turning a crisis into the long term was very helpful because you did have crises. You did have moments when the computer system wasn't working and you had huge backlogs and using that to drive the urgency for the, for the overhaul, I think, I think was really helpful. Heather, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and I think the challenges that you both raised really came through in, in the evaluation and our discussions uh, with people in the states. Another one that um, came up a lot was the challenge on the front lines with frontline workers who were really good at their jobs and knew how to, to do the process that they had been doing for a long time and knew the workarounds. Uh, and then as those processes were changing and being streamlined and the policies were changing, it was sometimes really hard for the, the workers who took great pride in their knowledge to step back and, and move to a different system and recognize that this was in the interest of helping the families, and which was their, their goal in being good at their jobs, that this new process would also help the families. Bob, anything you want to add? You don't have to. <coughs> well, just a, a, I work more at the federal than the state level, so this is kind of a federal thought, and it's by no means limited to or focused on WSS type issues, it's government wide. So we've talked, you've, you've been talking in just in the last couple of minutes about stretched staff having to focus on immediate crises or immediate needs. And then beyond that, there's, as you've 
Heather just mentioned, the issue of people used to doing things a certain way. And there's a great value, I think, in federal and state agencies in being able to constantly have an inflow, it needn't be large, of really talented new staff, particularly younger staff who are going to be perhaps more adept or uh, comfortable with IT and new ways of thinking of things. When I was in the federal government in the late 70s, it benefited greatly from the fact that in the 60s and 70s, large numbers of very talented, bright young people inspired, starting with John F. Kennedy and beyond, saw civil service as really an excellent thing to do, and many very talented people went in. For several decades now at the federal level, we've had such tight controls and limits on federal hiring that the federal workforce has shrunk and agencies have had much less ability to bring in new people. And if we want agencies and bureaucracies to constantly be on top of IT developments and seizing opportunities to make programs work better, they need the opportunity to be attracting bright young people in. So I really, uh, this, is, this goes from the Social Security Administration to everything else. I really worry now that a lot of the people who entered federal service in the 60s and 70s are retiring. And we've kind of starved a lot of the federal agencies of a similar kind of new influx of a talent pool. I think this has challenges for improved program operations across government for the future and that it really ought to be a higher priority of policymakers of both parties to find ways to reinvigorate and make more attractive and provide slots for creative young people to come in and reinvigorate various agencies. Let me build a little bit on this um, honesty about the challenges because when you think about these changes from the perspective of groups outside, right, advocates who many of us uh, here have both identities, right? We are, we work with advocates and with agencies. It can be very hard to tell whether a huge mess that comes from a new computer system is because you haven't yet rejuvenated the staff, done the training, you're on your way to a better world, but it's a few months away, versus you're making a terrible mistake and you're making people's lives worse. And that's, I think, a very live issue among the advocates we, we work with, both both the question of, is it really going to get better? What can I do to make it get better? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I wonder if maybe a couple people on the panel would want to give any advice you would have to advocates in a state about their role or how to hold states accountable or how they should see that kind of question. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I would say is be there early, right? I mean, by the time a technology project has gone south, it, it's, it's essentially unfixable. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and that's, I mean, it's unfortunate, but I think that's the kind of the reality, right? That w once a big IT project has, has, has launched and people see that it's not working, uh, th there are very real limits to how much you can either scale up staff or bring in more contractors. There's only so much you can do to move the needle at that point. And so many major IT projects are blown based on scope problems or governance issues that people easily could have identified at inception. Um, and it's, it, it, it is tragic to watch it play out over and over and over again. But, but it's something we do so commonly in government. You know, and I think, you know, I think for the advocates, it, it's, it's know when these projects are coming and, and, and make sure that the responsible agencies are you know, very open very early on about what kinds of updates they're going to give the general public and what kind of visibility there's going to be into that project from the outside and what kind of outside of the agency stakeholder participation there's going to be. Because if you don't get in front of it and make sure that you can see into it, um, those, you know, the projects that are run and, you know, behind closed doors that nobody gets to see into are the ones that blow up. And, and by the time that happens, it, it, it's It's interesting. I would argue that both Illinois and North Carolina had blow-ups that they fixed, but not necessarily behind closed doors blow up. Yeah. So that's interesting. Heather, did you want to add? Um, I agree with what, what you said. But then also, uh, so Colorado had a major change to its IT system before the WSS period. And advocates sued the state because the 
the system was so poor in delivering benefits. And so that was, that was a, a blow to the state, but it also was a really important external accountability for the state and helped the state have the focus that it needed to address that problem and fix it. Uh, and now Colorado's in a, a really great place compared to And they were able, in part because of the suit, to invest resources even before the federal resources mm -hmm. became available. See, Marie, do you want to add anything on that question? Yeah, so just um, a couple points um, that just I've heard across states would be to wait to launch, if possible, for a large new technology, um, if possible for you know a huge change to your process or huge change to your technology, to um, to be willing to stop and say we should plan more. And if you have an external push or a deadline like ACA that that pushes you um, to need to implement right away. Um, then states have said, you know, pay attention to errors. Listen to your advocates as they're letting you know where families are struggling. Um, have that feedback loop, but wait if possible, and if not possible, have your eyes open to see those issues right away. I mean, I would also add to the accountability while it's going on, sort of Heather's point, which is that the old, knowing how the old systems failed is also very helpful, because it's usually not as though people are moving away from from complete successes. Well, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions and then go to the room. So please start jotting down your questions and send them in. Um, it's events at urban.org. So I'm going to ask everybody about the biggest surprise. I said that what's fun for me about this panel is that this was seven years ago we began this. So I'm going to ask everybody if you want to mention from whenever you came into WSS, what is it that surprised you most? And who would like to start? Do you want to? I can start. Okay. So I think one surprise, and I hope this wasn't a surprise to Helen and Ford, but that a small, relatively small grant makes such a big difference. So the, the size of the grants to the states were minuscule compared to their state budgets. But it, the grant, with the external motivation and accountability that came with this project, gave the states just enough space to focus. Often it was enough to hire someone whose full-time job it was, was to pay attention to these changes. So just having that space to focus on these concepts um, was what was needed to act on them. And I think the fact that half the states applied for, to participate suggests that there was a lot of interest and, and um, desire out there for that. And for the states who, who did get this grant, they, they got the gift of that space. Well, do you want to? you have a surprise to offer? Or? I don't know that it was a surprise, uh, but I, I was really heartened by the degree of state interest. I, I think it was mm -hmm. mentioned what the 27 states originally applied. The degree of state interest across uh, political coloration of the states, I had wondered a little uh, about whether some states would be less interested because, for example, if you succeed in serving more people in Medicaid, there's a state financing share. And it was just very heartening to see the very broad, wide interest across states in making the programs work better, both from an administrative standpoint and a serving family standpoint, uh, including serving more of the eligible. I mean, it's interesting because Stacy, who I think has stepped out for a moment, Stacy and I disagreed about what we were worried about at the beginning. I was worried we'd have too few. Like you, I was afraid we wouldn't have enough applications. She was worried we'd have too many to handle, and she was a lot closer to being right. So. See, Marie, anything you want to add? Surprise? I think um, how different the states were, um, the six states, and how much we had in common and could share as peers. Um, that states that had very separate systems, very separate agencies, had a lot to learn from states that were very integrated. Our, our different challenges did, did not preclude us from learning a lot from each other. And so for any state looking to take on um, a new challenge, a new initiative, uh, to reach out to states that are interested in the same work or doing the same work, um, I'd really encourage that. Ms. Jim? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd previously been Secretary of Administration, and so it was a, it, it's a very centrally located, uh, you know, kind of an agency where everybody's in one place. You know, and at HHS, you know, half of our staff are scattered throughout those county offices all across the state. And I think the thing that really um, 
sort of struck me was just the level of variation in terms of the relationship between us and the Department of Social Services in those counties. I mean, so we had a number of them where everybody got along perfectly well. You know, the one you know, nightmare that sticks with me is, is, and thankfully this is prior to my tenure, um, but uh, there was a county office where they had painted the hallways a different color. And DSS employees were only allowed to walk in the yellow hallways, and our employees were only allowed to walk in the white hallways. And because they were there first, and we were the cast-off agency, our folks had to walk the long way around to get to the bathrooms because they didn't want us hanging out in their space, right? You know, that was pretty far at the end of the spectrum in terms of what the relationship looked like, but, um, but just a ton of variation across the county. And so, and so a very different kind of a project you know, from place to place. Interesting. Well, I'm going to add one which surprised me, which was that I had never expected the level of impact at the federal level that we got. Um, particularly in a world where federal um, em appointees and employees have limited travel dollars, um, the ability to have states be thoughtful and bring them interest and experience, I th in addition to the extraordinary credibility of the expert staff at the center and at class, meant that um, the, the lessons from the states looped back into influence on federal policies and regulations, and in the case of child care, even, I think, on the federal statute. So with that, I'm going to look for hands with questions in the room. And then you'll also bring me some from the, go here and then there. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, this is a really interesting session. And I was sort of surprised at how quickly talking about work supports moved into talking about computer systems. And it reminds me of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which is slowly going into implementation, and how many times I've sat in a room and everybody's talking about computer systems. And um, what I wanted to know was what lessons you could give to them, and I'm not thinking in terms of answering it now, but how do we hook some of your experienced people up with the folks who are now sitting in a room trying to figure out how do we make workforce and um, adult education and rehab, voc rehab work seamlessly together. Interesting. I have an idea about both a similarity and a difference, but let me let others get in first. Who wants to? So Terry wants to know, what could you learn from here that would be relevant to trying to do better computer systems work in the other? Systems, go ahead. One uh, lesson that we heard from the states is making sure, and I guess this relates to what Christian just said, about having all the peop right people at the table at the beginning and uh, making sure that all of the, the agencies or programs that are at all connected are at the table, that the policy people are there to translate um, in, for the technology. I mean, sometimes the technology, the people who are doing the technology think that they are making it match the policy, but it's when the policy people are in the room that they can actually um, correct misunderstandings. Uh, so having all of those people in the room at the same time, and the, the people, the, you need some frontline people there too who know on the ground how does this really work. It sounds good in theory, but is it going to work on the ground? Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, maybe just I mean, two quick things. I mean, you know, one is, and I think this is probably a general lesson on procuring IT systems, and especially in the government space, is you know, anytime you talk to an IT salesperson and say, this is a feature I need for my system, they say, oh, our system can do that, right? <laughs> and if you have enough time and money, all technology systems can accomplish all goals, right? You know, and, and so I think that's one. And two, I, I think we, we tend to, to over-rely on, on the technology itself. Right, that we're so accustomed now to having a system for everything, and we're so accustomed to integration work and so forth. And it, it's amazing how many projects. The, the, the really the best answer is to just have somebody with a spreadsheet. You know, um, that that w we tend to look for multi-million-dollar solutions to a lot of systems when um, there are, there are lower-tech ways to probably get better outcomes in a more reasonable time frame. Yeah. So I would give a variant of that. Oh, I'm sorry, you wanted to get in. Yes. Just, just one note, multiple states said that laying technology on top of a process that is not a good process um, is, is not the answer, that you need to look at your processes and if they are not efficient, if they don't meet customer needs already, 
creating a technology to, um, to follow that, that inefficient process will not help you. And a version, another variation on that that we heard was technology should never lead. The issue should be your goals, your policy goals, the process that will get you to those goals. And I said that in a speech to a lot of the big technology companies, and they all gave me all the reasons it was wrong. It's like, no, no. The people who do the program and the policy side don't know what's available. We know better. And it's like, you can staff them, you can tell them things, but, um, but they, they really need to lead. I will note that in this world, there were billions of federal dollars available for improving your systems in a coordinated Medicaid and human services way. And that does make it a somewhat different world from, from others. But that was important. I had, yes. Okay, you guys touched briefly on SNAP, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on other positive changes to the application process or like any specifics that you have. Okay, positive changes in particular within SNAP. Um, Heather, do you wanna start? And sure, so um, one that was alluded to generally is um, looking at what the state might require for for verification of eligibility um, beyond what the federal government um, requires. So some states were requiring documentation that the federal government didn't, uh, didn't require. So when they didn't receive it, the case was delayed or the case was in error while they were waiting for what was essentially unnecessary documentation. So some states changed their um, policies there to streamline to only what they really needed. They really looked through, the states looked through their own um, policies and reviewed them to make sure that they made sense for the state. Bob or Seamary? Well, I just think in, not just in SNAP, in all the programs, uh, something as I understand it that emerged during the project was the importance of reducing churn. And I know in some states, I'm thinking of figures Stacy showed me a few years ago on Idaho, where the progress in reducing churn in the SNAP program was quite dramatic. And so I, I you know, there are a variety of things one needs to do to do that. But uh, certainly I think that's one of the things that's emerged from the project is how do you integrate renewal processes across programs in order to reduce people falling off and then having to come back after a few months gap. So sort of for people who don't know what the word churn stands for, one of the big lessons early on is states looked as, at why they were not serving as many, as large a share of eligibles, was that it wasn't just about who came in the door, it was about whether they stayed on through review and renewal processes. See, Marie? Um, Did you want to add something? So I think the co commitment to same day service is just what I add, which has been, um, which has been mentioned instead of taking, taking an application and saying, well, we'll review this. Um, thanks, thanks for seeing you. When you have a customer there, you wanna go ahead and um, process that application as soon as possible. Also, applications coming in on the web uh, creates a different type of process and states need to sit down and look at how do you um, create a process that gives very quick service to applications coming in on the web. And so, for example, in Illinois, an application comes in on the web, it comes into a queue in the online system, and that person is called right away as if they are someone walking in the door. And so you don't want your web applications to experience a delay that your phone and your walk-in applications aren't. Anything you wanna add? No, I think we probably hit most of them. Well, I have one from the web which asks about TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, um, and asks whether some of the administrative problems that affected Medicaid and SNAP might also have been a reason for the reduction in, the serv in services to TANF. And while the project didn't nationally require states to get involved um, to work on TANF, some of them in fact did. So I don't know, if, I mean, my, my guess, by the way, is that there were a lot of additional factors driving reduced um, participation in TANF, but I don't know whether um, from the from anyone any of these factors were part of it. Yeah, I think there are a lot of other factors too. But in in some states like Illinois, it's the same process and the same workers who are accepting the applications for the multiple programs. So if you have 
a, a lobby that is very confusing and an application that is very confusing and even figuring out which application can be confusing, um, that affects the TANF applicants as well as SNAP and Medicaid applicants. But one would have to say that these factors are very small as a share of the explanation for the decline in TANF caseloads. After all, during this period, SNAP and Medicaid caseloads are up substantially. Right. TANF in 1995 for every 100 poor families with children, about 70 families received cash assistance through TANF. Today it's 23. In some states it's below 10. So the conversion of TANF into a block grant, the flexibility of the money where uh, only, if I remember correctly, only less than a quarter of the money is now used for cash That's assistance. Right. Only 50 percent is used for cash work or child care. It's kind of gone for lots of other things in state budgets. And then there are the issues of the, the time limits, work requirements, all kinds of other things. So I, I think m the overwhelming explanation okay. for the dramatic decline in TANF caseloads lies elsewhere. And that partly says that this set of strategies is connected in part to the structure of these programs and might not automatically work so well for programs structured in a, in well, a having, having said that, and I say this without knowledge, my guess is that take an issue like churning, that there's probably churning in TANF as there is in other programs that causes some people states would otherwise serve to disappear. I don't mean to say these aren't factors in TANF, just that they're dwarfed by the other factors. Absolutely. The question over here, I think. Um, so Heather mentioned it at the beginning, and you mentioned it again, that <clears throat> this one-day turnaround in applications and almost instant approval, it's mind-boggling to me because on the tax side, we're thinking about slowing down refunds, mostly to try to ferret out fraud. Can you talk about some of the factors that make it possible to get a SNAP application approved so quickly? And is there a cost in terms of accuracy that's happening? It's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. I'm going to give one headline and then let others who know more say more, which is that a number of the states were quite struck that they could improve accuracy and speed up at the same time because if you're using, A, if you're asking for verification that you don't have to ask for and then messing it up, that gives you errors and holds things up. And B, having workers re-enter things multiple times is a source of error, so sometimes you can avoid that. But it's a, a very good question that a number of the states wrestled with. No, you want to comment? Yeah, so I think for, yeah, for one, for me, it goes back to the importance of data sharing agreements, right? So since I came out to HHS, we now have data sharing agreements with our Department of Revenue. Um, you know, we, we had one through the Department of Social Services as part of this project. We have one with our Employment and Workforce Agency to get access to income data from them. Um, we have one actually with our Department of Corrections now for a prison health project we're doing it. You know, and having, having those frameworks in place um, allow us to, you know, swap data in ways that just weren't there before. I, I think the other thing I actually heard a minute or two ago is um, just the, what the marketplace can supply is also just significantly better today than it was even a decade ago. Um, you know, in thinking about obligations states have, um, uh, you know, the federal government now requires that states get asset verification systems uh, as part of their Medicaid program. Last time I checked, there were maybe five states that were compliant. Um, we're going to be probably number six. We're this close right now, uh, if anybody from CMS is watching. Um, so, <laughs> this close. Um, but, you know, but, but, but that's another you know, um, information source that lets us get to a lot of other people's information about who has what kind of resources um, that we just weren't able to get our hands on just even a few years ago. Bob, you know the tax world well. Do you want to say anything about why it's possible here and whether there are differences? Well, the first step is that the Congress should finally invest the money for the Internal Revenue Service to be able to modernize its information technology system. <laughs> it is insane to have unmet needs in the country, a $450 billion a year tax gap, and IRS processes that are years behind. So when you file your tax return and you have the W-2 on it, they actually don't have the electronic ability now to match the information on the W-2 to the information on the tax return and processing. 
The W-2s are sent off to the Social Security Administration, and if they do matches and find problems, it comes back through the system six months later. So what the IRS, now that information technology has advanced some, what they're looking at is can we have a period where we have a couple of weeks in which we can do data matching and maybe identify some questionable returns. Um, but larger uh, response, I think, to your question is that information technology, I, I think as the other panelists have said, um, in many occasions it can allow you to speed up the process, improve client service, and improve accuracy at the same time. And the example that pops into my head was in 2006, Congress enacted a requirement, it was called the Citizenship Documentation Requirement, that uh, for Medicaid, it was a Medicaid requirement that uh, you had to have documents to verify the person's citizenship or eligible immigrant documentation status and in the first couple of years that it was in effect, in seven states where we had extensive data, tens of thousands of eligible kids, mostly citizen kids, either got delayed or denied because they couldn't get the right documents in the right time, and they come into the office, they get back and ask for other documents. In the 2009 legislation, a modification was made to set up a system where the states could just batch all these requests and submit them overnight, I think it is, to the Social Security Administration, which does overnight matches and gets the data back. Processing speeded up, state administrative costs went down, much faster service for families, error rates went down. So, you know, the, the goal is where we can find matching systems that can readily be used to verify things almost overnight in ways that improve the system for everybody. But IRS has a ways to go on that. But it, it's not a criticism of IRS. The blame should be <laughs> squarely, in my view, on the Congress for not providing the service, the resources, to make big advances in, in IT. Well, and I'm actually, what I love about that question, besides that I'd never thought of it, which is one of the great reasons to have this kind of panel, is that it's typical for people in the human services agencies and the public perception of those agencies that they're deeply behind. So the idea that same-day service numbers are striking and positive is, is, I think, very appealing. I'm going to ask one closing question that just came in from the web, and then I'm going to, after I ask that, I'm going to give the panel a chance to offer a last takeaway directed at anyone they want, the audience in general or states or philanthropy or the federal government. But first, let me ask you a closing question. Um, Christian talked about how diverse the issues were in the different county and local offices you worked with. Two of the six WSS states formally have county-run systems, Colorado and North Carolina, county-operated, state-supervised, which means counties make a lot of the decisions um, have a, to varying degrees some money in it as well, especially for administration. So the question is from someone in Colorado who asks, in the more than 10 states with county administered systems, it's really hard to consistently improve service delivery and efficiency. What worked in WSS to do that? And I'm going to get Seamary and Heather, who saw this from the overall perspective, and then if Christian wants to add anything. Do you want to add county lessons? Uh, so, uh, two things came to mind from a state perspective that I think also is shared across the county um, that Christian has mentioned. The differences across offices, whether you're state or county administered, will be great, and the need for communication and buy-in. So the need to sit down with your, your state agency and your county agencies or your local offices to sit down and work in partnership towards a shared goal of customer service and that be a clear expectation, that be clearly identified um, is extremely important and having a, a shared goal pushes you towards that. And so I think that um, a, a closer partnership between the, the state agency and your county or local office is extremely important. Heather? Yeah, and I would echo that. Um, in Colorado, I think one of the successes of their, um, during the WSS initiative time, was vastly improving the relationship between the state and the counties. Uh, we heard about counties feeling like the state was just there in a gotcha 
mode uh, and not a partner. And by the end of the, the period, we heard uh, county people saying they really felt like they were in partnership with the state. Uh, and so that was including county leaders in decision making, um, in wrestling with the problems, and in finding the solutions, uh, and state leaders going to the counties and in person and really demonstrating their commitment to listening um, and working in partnership with the counties. So I think that, that partnership and that trust that they built really was an important foundation for moving forward on some of the things that um, Samaria you mentioned. Add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I've experienced both models. I mean, so in Pennsylvania, it's a county-based uh, human services model. In South Carolina, we, we have a number of county-level offices, but they're state-owned and operated offices. Um, in, I mean, my experience was that, frankly, having uh, county-level work did not offer additional benefits. It just added complexity and headaches. And the way I solved that problem was I moved. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of other practical ideas, because I think the person asking the question in Colorado was not contemplating that solution. It's not available to everybody. Yeah. That's right. Um, money helps. Colorado was able at the beginning, because they listened to the counties, to get the legislature to put some dollars into improving a computer system. That was driving the counties nuts, so sort of listening to people's perceived problems. The other thing that always struck me, having worked at state and federal levels, including state in a county-based system in New York, is that the way the counties see the state is the same way the states see the federal government. And so, right, so what drives states nuts is the fact they're hearing from HHS and USDA and other agencies all separately. It drives counties nuts when the state people are coming separately. So doing that together was very powerful. And it also required new skills of state people yeah. to be able to, to work effectively, I think would, would be on my, on my list. So I think with that, we're almost at the end. We have five more minutes. And I'm going to use that time to get a closing thought from each of the um, panelists about a takeaway that you particularly would want to share. And I think maybe I'll go in the same order as the initial remarks and start with Heather. OK. Uh, so since I'm here representing the evaluation, I did want to talk about um, just the challenge of evaluating a complex cross-systems uh, change effort like this, um, and yet the importance of doing that. Uh, so this, states are making simultaneous interrelated changes that make it really hard to isolate the effects of any particular change. Um, states had difficulty getting the data that we would need. Um, and some of the changes are simply hard to quantify. Changes in, um, in the culture and emphasizing a new vision of co improved customer service. Um, all those things are really difficult to do. Uh, but it's still important to assess the change to the extent that we can. So your advice to, is to sh people should invest in it. even you if should invest in it to show that it is possible and then how it is possible. Great. Thank you. Um, we don't have one today in South Carolina, but I, I would say an integrated eligibility system is important, right? And, and I think the efforts that we can bring to bear to drive towards that model are helpful. We are exploring it with social services right now, where they're looking at potentially coming onto our platform. As we heard about IRS's technology problems a few minutes ago, I thought, boy, if only they can get more 9010 money, uh, they'd be able to solve all those problems right away. But I mean, it's I mean, I mean, certainly the feds have put a lot of financial levers out there to try to promote that kind of integration work. And I think that, that, that uh, that's a mechanism through which we can get at a lot of these other so issues. So you would advise your fellow cabinet secretaries to really go for that? So to work job. towards that model. Great. Right. Um, um Mine would, would echo um, Heather's surprise about the, that small amount of dedicated resources having such a big change. The dedicated resources to bring in consultants or improve training or create a team that's dedicated to looking across policy um, to implement improvements, um, I think is extremely important. So my takeaway would be to philanthropy that, um, to philanthropy, to um, anyone who is in a position to invest in government systems um, to continue those investments because there's that potential for large scale change. Bob? I think we should start thinking, this is probably work state by state, to can one set civic expectations that the agencies, the political leaders of the state buy into, civic expectations that nearly all 
children who are eligible for, say, both Medicaid and SNAP should be served in both programs. So I don't know what the precise percentages could be. One could have an ultimate goal of 90 percent, 95 percent, and have year-by-year -year targets to get there. Uh, I think to the degree if this became a broadly agreed upon civic expectation and goal, it would help in making progress towards this and getting the lessons from this demonstration more widely uh, replicated or applied in other states. We have one not exactly perfect analogy, but there is a goal that 95% um, of children certified for SNAP are to be auto-enrolled in preschool meals. And I think there was an interim point at one point where if a state didn't get to 90% after a certain number of years, it had to do a corrective action plan. And this has really been very successful, and most states are way up there now in the 90s. Now, I don't see the federal government mandating something similar at any point in the foreseeable future in Medicaid or SNAP, but uh, community groups, advocates, agency people, public officials in states can work together to set for their state a set of goals like this and monitor progress towards it. So I guess I would like to see efforts like that in a number of states now that we've seen through this project that significant progress can be made. Thank you. Please join me in thanking this extraordinary panel. Thank you.